Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Manic Expression, the Comic Book Cast, the Reopen Nickelodeon Studios and Orlando, Florida Facebook page, the PlayStation Let's Play channel, and for entertainment's sake. week's episode of casual chats i am patricia and i am here with two very special guests in our very first double interview they have pretty much been the definition of your childhood they have created shows such as uh recess and rugrats and they've written for programs such as hey arnold and the pound puppies cartoon that is over in the hub um i have none other here than uh paul germain and i sorry if i butcher this joe aslin be here I believe. Uh, and Sullivan here. And Sullivan be here, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, and welcome to Casual Chats. Hello. I guess the first person I wanted to ask uh, is uh, uh, the both of you regarding about where you got your influences in doing writing and uh, animation. No, no. Paul, where'd you get your influences from? What are your influences? Well, I kind of got into animation sort of like slipping on a banana peel. Uh, I had always intended to go into live action, and then in the 1980s, I was working on the Tracy Ullman show uh, for Jim Brooks, and which is a long time ago, and uh, I they decided to put interstitial cartoons between the sketches on the old Tracy Ullman show, and they wanted to use Matt Groening's work, and I was a huge fan of Matt Groening's, and I, made, I kind of said, oh, it's a great idea, I love that idea, and they said, great. You go and do it. Go and give us uh, two minutes of animation a week. And I said, I don't know anything about animation. And they said, well, you better learn. And I found myself getting into animation that way. And that's how I did it. How about you, Joe? Um, well, you know, I mean, I liked all the old stuff. I mean, Paul and I met in film school. And when I finished film school, while Paul was working for James L. Brooks, I was just off writing screenplays with this other guy. Um <laughs> Another, who was more friends with Paul, actually, than with me. And that's my son, Hugo, who's bashing his block. We like things like Robert Altman and, you know, all the 70s films, like The Godfather and stuff like that. But also like things like Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse and <laughs> Mad Magazine and things like that. And I think what happened was, I, I, sometimes I think you just look back at life and you go, oh, this is just the way it was going to happen, you know? So it happened that I had a lot of friends who at UCLA, who were in the animation department. My roommate was an animator. We knew that we had mutual friends like David Silverman was there and stuff like that, all these people who ended up working in animation. And then when I got out of school after years of writing features that never got made, um, some friends of mine founded a company called Rhythm and Hughes, which became a big animation company, an early CGI company. <laughs> and then Paul... Hey, Gaga. Yeah. And then Paul called one day and um, looking for a new credit sequence on hey, on Tracy Ullman. And that's how he and I reconnected. Um, so, yeah. So it's kind of a weird trip. It's, it never goes straight. It never goes the way you think it's going to go. That's straight line. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I think one of the interesting things about it is that you plan on doing like this one particular goal, and then it goes into a completely different goal, and then it kind of meshes into a point in which... It was kind of like what you wanted to do in the first place, but you were able to build another huge impact that you never thought that you would. Right, right. And also starting off with, you know, the Tracy Ullman show and then later on going into The Simpsons, uh, what kind of lessons did you learn that you would take on to do Rugrats with um, Gabor Chupo and um, Arlene Klasky? Well, I... What happened there was uh, we decided to do the, you know, Brooks decided to do these one-minute cartoons. I was put in charge of it, and I was looking for an interesting 
animation studio that would do work that was more than just kind of the standard, you know, uh, kind of Hanna-Barbera look that you saw on TV. I was looking for something a little different. And I found Gabor Chupo, who at the time was, he had a little company that was doing, kind of making spinning logos and things like that, but he was an Eastern European trained animator and he wanted to do something, he wanted to do character animation. And when I called him looking for estimates from the different animation companies in Los Angeles to try to put this together, he really showed me an exciting reel of animation work and he came to us with a great bid and we ended up hiring him. Um, and one of the things I learned from that is sometimes you got to be a cowboy and go after things you want and go after them hard to make things happen. So you, and that's, so that's one lesson I learned. Uh, another few lessons I learned had to do with how you make a cartoon and how you make it funny and how you make it work. And uh, one of the things, you know, as I was going into animation and I and you know was trying to put this project together, I realized that that you know most of the animation that was that was done was going to be shot was going to be the actual animation was going to be done in Korea. And I thought, well, are they going to understand our jokes? Are they, you know, are they going to? Is the language barrier going to be an issue? And I was worried that the animation might not work and I thought how can I guarantee a certain level of quality if the animation turns out not being good and I thought well if I write a good script with Matt you know and if we record it and I edit the tracks and make a little radio show out of it and the radio show works and the dialogue works then whether or not the animation plays visually at least it'll work the audio will work and so we set up the system where you we would write the scripts and record the tracks and get that just right, and then it would go to the uh, the rest of the process. Uh, and that is kind of the style that Joe and I have stuck with all these years. We, we always kind of work from script and story, and then move to, you know, voices, and then we get to the animation. And whether, you know, and that's always worked for us, and that's kind of a style I learned there and what I took to Rugrats. I also learned when looking at the original three seasons of Rugrats that um, I felt that they were very simple, but at the same time there was a lot of complexity in talking about the perspectiveness of a child and what the adults were going through. And I think that, you know, similar to The Simpsons, in which you got the child perspective and the adult perspective, and you had a lot of jokes that only the adults would get, and then the kids would kind of not know about it the first time, I think that's what made the, um, the series work the first time, was that it was able to gravitate towards a general audience as opposed to, like, a certain demographic. Yeah, well, you know, Joe, I'm sure Joe's going to have a lot to say about that, too. I'll just say right now that we did that very intentionally. We always wanted to aim the show at two audiences at the same time, at kids who would be watching these little characters that were a lot like them, and at adults do little jokes with, with, you know, that, that were more adult stuff that kids might not, you know, not even get. And we did both and it kind of worked for us. So, you know, our hope was that kids would be watching the show and their parents would, you know, come through the living room and see it on the TV and go, Hey, that looks pretty cool. <laughs> and sit down and find there was something there for them too. Yes, I, I definitely agree. Uh, Joe, as one of the main writers, and you would most likely get together with all the other writers and discuss about what would be the next episode um, what were your process of trying to find out about, oh, which lesson are we going to talk about or, you know, which character we're going to develop more or which uh, scenario we're going to be able to discuss on uh, each episode and how we can be able to make it towards a general audience as opposed to, like, being really one-dimensional? Well, I think there was an evolution that happened. If you look at the first season, there was a desire, which is very, you know, normal, I think, to give the main characters, who are the babies in Rugrats, uh, a drive, you know, something that they were going to be going after. And so, uh, you know, which is typical of I mean, any story needs, you know, the characters need to want something. Otherwise, you don't really have a story, right? So at the beginning, they were wanting very simple things. Like they were wanting, you know, they'd lose a ball or they'd lose a car or something that they wanted. And then they'd follow that. I had a writing partner at the time who has since died, actually. His name was Steve Vixton. He was an, he's a name who might come up 
a couple of times for you because he was involved with Arnold a lot too, with Hey Arnold. Yes, I actually know about Steve Vixton. Our, our friend Matthew Clickstein uh, interviewed him for the book Slimed, and okay. um, when rewatching the episodes of Hey Arnold recently, I found out that a lot of my favorite episodes were written by him. So, I well, Steve, Steve and I were partners. I, I actually talked to Matthew about Slime too. I'm in there too. But, yes. you know, the thing is, with Steve, Steve and I, we worked together. We were a writing team since film school, since, like, 1980, I don't know, 4 or something like that, or 84, 85. So we've been writing a lot together, and we had a sort of a idea of what, you know, of what film was and, you know, what storytelling was and all this kind of stuff that we kind of had talked about a lot between ourselves. But Steve was a real loner. He was a real, um, he was kind of like a hermit almost, you know? Hmm. Very funny guy, really, really funny. And if you were hanging out with him, you'd think he was your best friend ever. And he, I would say I probably was as close to him as anyone in his life, you know. But um, but even then, it was very difficult. So anyway, what happened is we came on to work on the first season of um, Rugrats. And, I mean, when we, we, were, we were used to working in the feature world. You know, we'd sold a bunch of stuff from, you know, to, like, to uh, companies like Paramount and you know, TriStar and companies like that. And we'd actually been working with directors and doing all this kind of stuff. And we just couldn't get anything made, you know? Yeah. So we, so Paul, Paul had been working for James L. Brooks and we knew Paul from film school too. And when Paul got this show going, he said, Hey, why don't you come work on it? Basically making a long story short, that's what happened. So we went over there and the first shows we worked on, we thought, Oh, they're going to hate these. These are too simple. You know, these are too, you know, and they loved them. They just loved everything that we wrote. And we were like, huh, that's interesting, you know, because we were just sort of used to getting a ridiculous amount of notes, you know. And so we just started really enjoying ourselves kind of early on. And about halfway through the first season, um, there were these ideas. There, the first one was Real or Robots. That was the first one in Rugrats where we went, oh, we could actually do something more interesting, you know. So so, like, the first few episodes, the first episodes, if you look at the episodes that we wrote, they were things like, you know, baby commercial or the one where they go, you know, they throw the ball over the fence, you know, uh, for the, you know, at the uh, barbecue. Or, you know, they were always, like, something simple. The kids had to go somewhere. They'd crawl somewhere, you know. And um, when we did Real or Robots, Paul had, it was Paul's idea. Paul had this idea, of like, you know, because I think he, when he was a kid, he had thought that, you know, like, what if my parents were robots, you know, so... So he said, what could, what could you guys do with this? And Steve and I were like, oh, what could we do with this besides do a parody? We were just kind of tired of parodies. And, and so we were talking in the middle of the night on the phone, and he and I both, I had said to him, you know, when I was a kid, and it was kind of the first time either of us had said to each other when I was a kid, you know? And I said to him, when I was a kid, I used to crawl into my parents' room and kept trying to wake him up, and my dad got mad at me, and he spanked me, and I still remember it, you know? Wow. And, and uh, Steve said, oh, that's great. We should do that. And I said, do what, you know? And he said, well, what if the story was that he keeps trying to crawl into mom and dad's room? So I think what happened was that I started going, oh, that's great. I'm going to start using childhood experiences, right? And you can sort of see in that one episode, for example, like where Steve and I also diverge, right? What interested Steve was... The parents, so how it would drive the dad crazy to be um, awoken over and over, you know. And so Steve had, just to give you an example of where that show went and how the sort of creatively things happened. So Steve had the, I don't know if you you know that episode. But, I do actually, yeah. I pretty much know a lot of the original runs. Steve was much more interested in the adults. Whoops, hold on. Whereas I was kind of interested in, Char you know, Tommy and Chucky and their adventure going down the hall. Steve was... Hold on. You go here. Steve was interested in, well, what happened to Stu? You know? what if He said, what if Stu had, and this didn't end up in the final thing, but a version of it did. Stu said, you go. Hold on, where's your phone? What if Stu had a tattoo on his chest? Oh. And it said, um, Ramona forever. Oh, Ramona, the assistant. Right. So... He said, and, and we put it in there, and it was like Ramona forever. And Gabor, who has a kind of naughty sense of humor, thought it was really funny. But Arlene hated it, right? <laughs> so we had this big fight about it. 
And I didn't, you know, I was like, okay, okay. And it, but anyway, this shows you where Steve goes, and this kind of shows you what happened with Arnold, right? So we went into Gobbler's office, and finally Nickelodeon said, you can't have, you know, Stu can't have a tattoo on his chest of another woman's name. And we're like, oh, darn, you know. So Gobbler said, what if you they open the guy's shirt, and they see his nipples, and they think that they are bolts, you know, like, um, you know. And they decide they're going to open up his chest plate. And we said, really? Could we do that? And he said, sure. And that's what we ended up doing, which seemed just as naughty to me, you know, <laughs> like, whatever. So anyway, but that short, you know, so Steve and I started writing these episodes of when we would write together, we, I think it was a pretty good balance. You know, it was like the kids and the adults, you know, it was always about the kids and the adults. What's going on with the kids and what's going on with the adults. I would usually start by thinking, well, do I have any kid memories, you know, like, you know, I was always trying to do one about where they open up. I don't know if we ever did do that one, where they open up the refrigerator and you know, does the light go on? You know, yeah, right? yeah, that, yeah. That was that's. So, I remember that one. That was when the lights went off, and then the they thought that all the lights in the in the entire house went over to the refrigerator, and so that's when they decided to explore and go down to the refrigerator. And then when they opened it, um, all of a sudden the lights go back on, and they thought that that was where it came from. Right. Well, those kind of stories, those kind of stories. I don't think I ended up writing that one, but it was like. We would, we would talk about him. We'd say, hey, you know, I remember when I was a kid, this would happen. But Steve would usually think, because he didn't love his childhood, honestly. You know, he didn't have a very fond memory, and very, very fond memories of his childhood. But he was more interested in adults being tormented by children, essentially, because that's how he viewed the world, you know. So anyway, so it was I, kind of a good partnership in a lot of ways, you know. Yeah, and it definitely made a lot of sense when you look back at um, other episodes that he also did, especially for Hey Arnold, and which he wrote a lot of the more adult-themed episodes, like Stoop Kid, and also, um, you know, he also co-wrote a, a bunch of episodes, uh, like there was the Christmas episode, the Thanksgiving episode. What I really appreciate about, you know, Steve, you know, going back to it, is that a lot of the stories that he's written for, they they had a really strong moral message, and that that's what makes... You know, the episodes that were featured on the early runs of Regrets and Hey Arnold, which, uh, of course, you also helped develop alongside with Steve and Craig Bartlett, whom Kevin and I also interviewed last year. When you look back on other episodes in which it has, like, that strong message that, you know, life isn't always perfect, but it's really easily relatable, which, you know, I can, you know, really appreciate on that because, you know, with a lot of, you know, kids shows, they always like to dumb things down, so... Yeah. I think that that's really um, admirable of, you know, people like Steve to do something like that. And it would have been really nice if maybe Kevin and I would have gotten a hold of him. The thing about Steve is, I really love the guy. But I also he also needed a lot of approval. And so, at the end of his life, he was saying a lot of things that were a little bit exaggerated about himself. I'm just being honest with you. About, like, he that he did it all, which he didn't do at all, you know? Right. Like, takes, you know, the development of Arnold is a good example. He did a lot. He's important on that show. Before Steve died, Craig was really angry at Steve. I don't know if you know this. Or no, not, he, he never mentioned this to us. Yeah, he was really angry because Steve had a tendency to go around saying that he created it, you know, that he did everything on it. Oh, wow. And, and, and so it's, you have to be a little bit careful in giving him too much a claim. Oh, no, 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 no. On the other hand, no, no, let me just finish what I was going to say, though. On the other hand, he was very, very important, and he was an element that pushed things in a direction that other people didn't want to go, honestly, including the um, executives at Nickelodeon. Right. You know, they talk about Steve now like he's some saint, but at the time, they were so angry at Steve, and Steve did a lot of things that, um, that made them mad for good reason, you know, like, you know, trying to trick them and stuff into putting things on the air that they wouldn't notice and stuff like that. I think a fairly common thing with um, people who are writing children's stuff from the very beginning, you know, whether it's in the Disney animators putting all the, you know, sneaking messages into things and stuff like that, you know, because it's kind of maddening to be told, oh, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, and you want to say, come on, kids are smart, they can figure this out, you know? Absolutely. So, and so I think in the case of Steve... The problem with Steve a little bit was, I think there was a point where Steve's stuff was absolutely amazing, but then he would always kind of push it eventually to places that I didn't want to go. That was why we broke up as a team, you know? Oh, because, I see. Because, like, for example, Stoop Kid's a good example. Stoop Kid, I just love that episode. I think that was a great episode. The episode where um, 
one of the last things that I was involved with Steve on, you know, the Christmas episode, I think is an amazing episode. I definitely agree. Uh, yeah, Craig and I that, were, were talking about that really briefly, and we mentioned about how it introduces kids to, you know, not only, you know, the meaning of Christmas, all that stuff, but it also kind of delves into Mr. Wynn's character about how he went through a war, which is not something that you even see in, you know, in kids shows nowadays. And I even mentioned this also briefly in the Veterans Day episode, which I find to be really underrated. Uh, you know, with the Christmas episode, I mean, people still regard that as probably one of the best Christmas specials ever. That's great. I mean, you know, it's funny because we've had a lot of fights over the years, you know, and I had decided I was leaving the show and I really wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I just, I had to get out of there because it wasn't a very creative place for me, you know? I understand. I, and so Steve and I, but Steve was, you know, Steve, it's a very important memory to me. Like, I have a personal thing about that episode. So what happened with me on that one was that Steve and I went to, to Chinese dinner and Steve said, before you leave, can you just help me crack this Christmas episode? And I said to him, I don't know, you know, I don't really, what, what have you got? And he kind of pitched me this secret Santa thing. And he said, I don't, I just don't know what else to do with it. But he had this other story that he had been trying to tell, this Vietnam story, for a long time. <laughs> and I said, well, what if, is there something else that you could do? Like, what, isn't there something more interesting than just the secret Santa thing? Could it lead to something else, like with one of the other borders? And kind of together, I can't remember which one of us said it, but... I think I said it, actually, but I said, what if it was Mr. Wynn and your little Vietnam story you've been trying to do? And he tries to get his daughter back. And Steve had this look in his eye, and it was a combination of, like, mischievousness, which I think he had. Like, on the one hand, he thought, oh, that would be amazing. And on the other hand, he thought, you think they'll let me do it? And he actually said, Nickelodeon will never let me do that. And I said, well, I don't know if they will or not, but if you did, it would be the first animated show that I know of to go to, to Vietnam and the only Christmas special I've ever heard of. And so we, it's funny because he gave me like a story by credit on it, which I, I don't really think I deserve because it really, both of them were his stories. You know, they were just, I just said, why don't you put them together? You know, but the thing is how that happened where, you know, Nickelodeon, they kind of, at that point, they weren't paying that much attention, which is weird. And they, they didn't want to, when they figured out that he was doing a Christmas episode that would go cut to Vietnam, they really didn't want him to do it. And Steve did one of these things. And this is, I think, where Steve and I started to like, where we ended up having our fights, is that Steve did this thing where he was trying to be secretive and he wrote a script without the Vietnam stuff in it, I think. I never heard the actual story of how this happened exactly, but I heard this one part that will make that makes sense this way. So um, by the time Nickelodeon realized there was a Vietnam flashback, it was already an animatic, right? So they could change it if they wanted to, but they were going to lose some money. So they took so – there was this executive named – I forget her name. Uh, Mary – Mary. Not Mary Harrington. She was working for Mary. Her name was Catherine something, and she had been an executive years before, like at the studios, and, and she was just like – this was kind of her retirement gig, you know? Okay. But anyway, okay. so she – took the episode home. Steve told me this story later. She said she took the episode home and she showed it to her. She had it up and she was just watching it. They were kind of like, are we going to fire this Vixen guy? That's what it was like, you know? Mm. And they, and they, she had it up and her son was watching it. Her little like 10 year old son. And at, at the, at the commercial break, the son turned to her and said, mom, is that what Vietnam was all about? And she just, called up you know and said okay it's a, approved go so you know steve did a lot of things through trickery you know like writing scripts that didn't have scenes in and then putting them in later and stuff like that you know to get these things passed through the system that nobody wanted you know those are some of the best things he did it, and then this is where i started like disagreeing with craig and steve about what the you know what the show is i kind of felt like the kid element started to disappear in the last seasons where it became more about like you know, the adults. Yeah. It just became more about, um, like the, the lounge singers and stuff like that. And I thought, eh, I'm not interested in that world. You know, if it was about the parents, that would be one thing, but it was more about, you know, the, the city world, the Frank Sinatra world that, that was a fascination for Steve because that's really what he was interested in. You asked me what was the key to what was happening in the nineties with all these shows that were like more interesting in some ways than what's happening now. And I think what was happening partly was that a lot of people were working at it who were, hadn't been interested in animation and hadn't been interested in children's television before. 
And they kind of got in through a side door, which was the explosion that happened with the Simpsons. When the Simpsons happened, all these people who never would have been even considered, like me, or Steve, or Peter Gaffney is another one, or um, all these people who just would not have been thought of as people who would write for children's animation were suddenly being asked to write, because... The people who were writing for The Simpsons were all these, you know, Conan O'Brien kids, you know? Yeah. These, these kids, that generation. And, and a lot of those people, like Peter Gaffney and John Rosenthal, I mean, John Greenberg, that he was a friend of ours too, and Rachel Lippman, all these people who worked on Rugrats were all people who came out of that world. They were all working at Harvard Lampoon, you know? Yeah, and, and also another you know. person that I really enjoyed from, who was also wor- who worked on Rugrats and went over to Hey Arnold, uh, Joseph Purry, who I also really love. He also wrote episodes like Pigeon Man. And um, and also one of my favorite episodes that you wrote for Hey Arnold was Tutoring Torvald. I actually watched that like last week and it was interesting about how you have this kid who is struggling with school and he's really tough. But at the same time, you know, you kind of see that he's just trying to make his mother proud. And it just gives another bit of depth that, you know, he's not just a bully for the sake of just being a bully. You know, there's a lot more into it this character, which I thought was really interesting. I think all of us were trying to do that. I mean, because we weren't really used to writing for children and we didn't really know what children's television was. And we weren't also interested in writing for animation because we didn't really know what that was. We didn't know what it was, you know? Right. So the other thing, I don't know if you've talked with people about, oh, by the way, Joe Purdy's one of my closest friends. I mean, I really love Joe Purdy. He's a great person. But the shows like... Like, I, I think there was a line that was being crossed at Pigeon Man for me, and that's when I left. Because I was like, I don't, not, I don't want to, the show to go that direction. And that's where it went. And it's fine. I don't have a problem that it went that way. And I know there are tons of fans of that direction. It's just that, you know, Torvald versus Pigeon Man or, like, Stoop Kid versus Pigeon Man, things go into the magical world that are, like, I'm not really sure anymore, like, where reality is and where it ends, you know? But I think Craig was always feeling comfortable with that, and so it was his show, you know? Yeah, so... Yeah. Where we started it, you know, when it, when it first began... I don't know if anybody's told you this story, but like, you know, Craig and, you know, because Craig knew Steve and me from Arnold. I mean, from uh, Rugrats. From Rugrats. Yes. And so he knew us as a team. But, you know, Steve left Rugrats, you know, pretty er- you know, early on. And basically I stay- stayed and was the head story editor for then for the next few seasons. And then Steve came back and started writing freelance with me or uh, for me. And then kind of came on staff for a little bit and then left and kept going and coming back in. Mm-hmm. So that's – and our relationship as a result really suffered because he came back going, hey, you know, I want to do it this way and say, well, we, the show went this other direction. And so, you know, we had – we were butting heads in, on Rugrats. Right. But then what happened was um, – and I don't know if you ever heard the whole story of Craig getting that show on uh, – Arnold, that's another story. He asked me and Steve, he still thought of us as partners because Craig had left the show pretty early on. He'd left Rugrats. So he asked me and Steve to come in and help him, thinking of us as a team still. And it, and it was kind of hard for us. But we decided we loved the show so much. You know, we loved what it could be so much that we decided to work on it. And we spent nights over at Craig's house just sitting in the backyard, working, 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 trying to figure out what the show could be because Craig's original thing was just a little claymation thing. And really, the Angelica character and the, um, I forget the other guy, the bully character, were kind of the same thing. It was a boy bully and a girl bully, and they were just bullying this daydreamer kid. I don't know if you've seen the shorts. They're beautiful shorts. Oh, yes, I have. I was actually telling Craig about that, that actually the Hey Arnold Claymation shorts were the first indication of me introduced to the character. I was five when I saw it on Sesame Street back in 1991. I saw the early one in which Arnold uses his imagination, and I still remember that to this day. And, you know, it was, I I told, you know, Craig about it and how I I was appreciative of it, and I told him about, you know, how I also love the Penny cartoons from Pee Wee's Playhouse. And and Craig was doing those when we were working in the very first season of Rugrats, he was going, he'd go home and shoot them at night and go home, you know, he would, Craig is like a bundle of energy. The guy just is constantly. Yeah. <laughs> but what I was going to say about those is as much as I love them, Arnold doesn't even speak in them. No. There's just a voiceover that says, what do you think, Arnold? You know, use your imagination, Arnold, and stuff like that. And, and then there was the one in church, which is my favorite one, where it's just like an old, you know, it's just somebody speaking, you know, it's just a, it was a recorded like uh, um, you know, like a priest talking that Craig had from from um, his childhood or something. And anyway, it's just they're really funny, wonderful cartoons. But nobody spoke, and you didn't have a lot of character. You didn't know who the different characters were. 
So we kind of worked out this whole thing, and that's very, you know, the setup of the show, I my tendency would have been to go more towards realistic kid show, which is how Recess comes along. You know, I wanted more of a show about what it was to be a kid. And Craig and Steve, and, you know, so the three of us together, there was like, we were all kind of like, you know, in that tension is where the show comes out of, which I think is makes it a good show, actually. But um, so Steve was always more interested in the tw- a slightly twisted take on things because yeah, he didn't have a very happy childhood for whatever reason. I mean, I love his parents. I know his parents really well. I know his sister, but for some reason he wasn't happy. So he had, but he had sort of a twisted view of things. And so I still remember, um, again, because Steve and I had worked together so long, we almost had a, a secret, you know, you know, how, you know how really good friends know each other and you don't have to finish sentences or sometimes you can just do things with a look. Yeah, Kevin and I have that kind of relationship, you know, with us being friends for almost 20 years. Yeah, and we, so we were working with Craig and it was the middle of the night and I remember it was around the time of the L.A. riots they were happening, so it must have been like 94 or something like that. But anyway, and Craig said, um, we were saying like, okay, let's say this, this Angel, uh, not Angelica, Helga, Let's say Helga loves Arnold. I mean, no, that's not what happened. We said, let's say Helga hates him, and, you know, she's a great main character, and we'd all, you know, we had Angelica. Angelica had been a big character on Rugrats. So, okay, but why? Why does she hate him so much? And uh, Craig's wife walked through the, the living room right at that moment as we were sitting there drinking wine and talking, you know, and she said, maybe it's because she loves him. And she just walks out of, walked out of the room. Her name's Lisa Grenning. She's Matt Grenning's sister. Yeah, no, that was actually really interesting. Craig, you know, when Craig and I talked about that, I thought that was pretty, yeah, pretty funny. And so, she, so she said this one line. She said, "What if he loves him?" And Steve and I just looked at each other, and I could see we both just smiled like that's it, you know. And Steve, I knew that from that moment, you know, that this was going to be like the key to Steve, you know, on the show was. And Craig picked up on it too, but it was like Steve was the one who took the the, the reins on it, you know, and. I just, you know, I thought that, you know, the shows I was liking at the very beginning were things like, you know, the, you know, Eugene's Bike and things like that. I really liked those shows. I thought those were really cool. And I just thought where we were going when I was leaving was more in, the show was going to a place that was more, um, it was more adult and it was more magical than I, than was my taste. Do you know what I mean? Of course. Yeah, and so I, I was just thinking, well, what's, you know, what's this about? Now, I think, you know, things out of that came shows like, you know, uh, Phineas and Ferb and things like that, you know. I mean, they'll, they'll, you know, I don't know if you know those guys, but they'll admit, you know, that they were, how much influence they were, because they were working. Dan Poppenmeyer was one of the directors on, on Hey Arnold. I know who Dan Poppenmeyer and Jeff Swampy Marsh are, but I've never met with them. But it would be nice if maybe I could get a hold of them someday, but I know they're really busy with Phineas and Ferb. But, he, I mean, you know, he said at one point, I think he told me, um, the way he looks, his pitch of Phineas and Ferb was, you know, uh, if uh, Hey Arnold and, and um, SpongeBob had a child, it would be this new show, you know, and that's kind of what they did, you know. Hmm. They, you know, and so you can sort of see, you know, the big musical sequences and things like that that where Craig and Steve were going. I mean, it's funny too, you know. I think where I get mad at Steve looking back is that he took credit for things that we did together or I did by myself, you know, that was part of the thing. And it that that kind of stuff bugs me. But I know that he was really sick for a long time, and he needed to do that, you know. That's what I get upset with him. I think when when you guys are talking about him, I get upset about it sometimes with him because I feel like, come on, Steve, you know, you didn't need to do that. There are things like, you know, like um, there's an episode where Grandma is trying to move a piano. And oh yeah, um, the list. Yes, I also love that episode. That was a great that, episode. I, that was completely my episode. He had nothing to do with it, and and I wrote that song and I sang that song and I and I wrote all the lyrics and I went into the off in the next office it was the middle of the night and Steve was in there and I said, Hey Steve, can I sing this to you? What do you think? I want it to be like an old nineteen thirties tin pan alley song that would have been written in the depression. And Steve said, I love that and he did give me some lines. And we sat down and what if you change this line to that? What if you change this line to that? And we played it and we sang it over into the tape recorder and we sent it over to Jim Lang and Jim Lang loved it. He didn't he changed it a little bit too, you know? It's all got changed a little bit. But in that book of um, that Matthew wrote, Steve said, I wrote that song. And I was like, no, you didn't, Steve. You know, but he was, at that point, he was very sick. 
and he was living up in Sacramento and, you know, an alcoholic and, a, you know, just in a sad way. So I've kind of forgiven him, but it, sometimes I just worry about, like, that he's going to, like, the mythology of Steve take over the world, you know? Well, from what you've uh, been telling me, Joe, I just want to let you know that that will definitely not be the case. I will make sure that you get the credit that you deserve. It's not even that. It's more like, and, and that, I don't want to sound petty about it either. It's more like, I really did love him. You know, he was like one of my closest friends for so long. And I've just always been like, why would you have to do that, Steve? You know, like, don't do that to me. You know, <laughs> I, I, I you know? completely understand. And, it, and the thing is, we had our fights. We had great fights over it. You know, we had we had great arguments because Steve didn't have children because I already had had children at that point. I have a daughter who's 25. So you know, probably your age, you know, I'm 28, but it's it's close. Yeah. So I know now I have a second kid who's like a year and a half, as you could hear. Yes. But, um, and he's coming in. But so he never went down that path, you know, and he was always a loner. He always lived alone. You know, he never got married. <laughs> hey, Hugo. And I, so in a lot of ways, I have a lot of things going for me. I shouldn't be mad at him. But he was like, you know, he was a really, really tight friend of mine from the time we were both about 22 years old until, you know, we were about 40, you know, and, and so it was kind of one of those things where, you know, creatively and we had this disagreement and yet things like you're talking about, like having a moral center and, and having, you know, I'm, I'm dealing, I'm working on a preschool show right now and I just get into these arguments with the executives all the time because they never want, you know, they go from wanting everything to be spelled out, you know, like, so everything's explained to the point where it has no weight anymore and then they flip the other way and end up wanting to they'll, and then they say oh we don't want to be didactic and you're like you know my favorite things in, in movies you know are often the most what you guys would call didactic you know it would be and and those are the things that steve and i used to talk about you know movies like shampoo you know where warren Beatty has that big speech I don't know if you know that speech, but he makes a big speech about women and how he feels about women. And Steve and I used to talk about those speeches and how much we loved those, you know. And um, and I know that Steve used to write those speeches, and I loved his speeches, and I write those kind of speeches too. And they almost always, execs want to cut them out. It's crazy what they think animation is and what it can be. And so that's – and the, other, the flip side of what I'm trying to say is I also miss Steve. You know, I miss that he was so passionate about his work that he would trick, try to trick people, <laughs> you know, into getting his stuff on the air. You know, and I miss that, and I don't want to – and I admire it. I admire the passion. I just don't necessarily admire the, um, the process, you know. I understand. Uh, Kevin, uh, did you have any questions for Paul? I, I have a question. What were some of the inspirations for the episodes that, that, that you have written? Like, when you have written an episode, what was, was there like a, were you inspired by something or like something that influenced you to write particular episodes? Sure, I can tell you there, was a, there were a number of different things that inspired different episodes. So, for example, initially when we started doing the show, we ended up doing episodes that we used to call The, kid, the Babies Go to X and Wreak Havoc, right? The first season we're all... The babies go to a psychiatrist's office and wreak havoc. The babies go to a baseball game and wreak havoc. The babies go to, uh, uh, you know, uh, just over and over again. The babies go to the movies and wreak havoc. And we were just going on that theme. By the time we got well into the first season, we began to realize, boy, this is getting kind of redundant. And we thought, what else can we do? And we started thinking about, about putting, you know, different types of stories that we could tell. And we made a list of, of ideas, and we started doing things like, okay, well, we've got Angelica, who is like the the mean the mean girl of the show, and we've got Chucky, who's kind of a heart of the show, and we've got Phil and Will, who are like your crazy, you know, best friends. We're just insane. <laughs> and we started thinking, you know, now that we've established these characters, what if we put funny different combinations of them together? What if we play them off each other? What if we start having them do things that are the opposite of what their personality is. So, for example, Chucky's always the reticent guy who's afraid to do things. Well, what if we do an episode where he suddenly decides he wants to take over? <laughs> what if we do an episode where suddenly he gets tough and mean and Angelica, gets, Angelica becomes timid? Or we thought, 
you know, or we thought, you know, what, it, 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 all those kinds of things. So that was the kind of episode we do where the characters would be the opposite of what you think they are yeah. for some reason, right? Yeah. And then another thing we started to do was certain kinds of episodes that felt like they were Chucky episodes. And those were the ones that Joe specialized in. So he loved to do episodes about, you know, Chucky is afraid of, of getting potty trained. So that was what he did. You know, <laughs> That's Chucky a great episode. Potty. Or, or um, Angelica decides to run away from home. <laughs> and, you know, and so she does that. We do an episode like that. Or we do one of my favorites that we, we you know, one of our, you know, Joe mentioned that we had this friend who was, um, you know, a mutual friend who became a writer on the show. Who was originally Joe's writing partner, who unfortunately died earlier this year. Sorry and about that. Yes. Thank you. It was, it was very sad. But Steve was a really, really funny writer, and he would he just loved Angelica. Angelica was his favorite character, and so he would <laughs> take off and do Angelica episodes. And one of them they did was where Angelica fakes breaking her leg. Do you remember that? Yes. yes. <laughs> I love that episode in which, you know, Angelica was just so over dramatic about taking advantage <laughs> of, you know, Dee Dee and Stu. And then you have that infamous scene in which Stu is making the chocolate pudding. And then Dee Dee's like, it's four o'clock in the morning. Why are you making yeah, chocolate pudding? That scene you're talking about where, where, where Stu is making the chocolate pudding. And Dee Dee comes in and says, Stu, what are you doing? And he says, making chocolate pudding. And she says, why? And he said, because I've lost control, control of, of my, my life. life. <laughs> it was maybe my favorite moment in Rugrats. Yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. And that's pure Steve Bixton. I'm, 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 I'm very sad that he's not with us anymore. I'm glad that we were able to bring back some fondness from Steve's work. And, um, you know, discussing about some of the episodes and... You know, I, I I actually have a friend of mine who's actually a huge Angelica fan. So hearing this, I'm sure he'll be really happy. Um, there was a question that I've actually wanted to ask you, uh, Paul, now that I got a hold of you. Um, when I was doing research regarding about Rugrats, there was a fact that it hasn't been really brought up until like some one interview back in, I think it was 90, uh, 94 or 95 regarding about the issue um, uh, about why Chucky's mom wasn't around, and according to what you said, Chaz and Melinda weren't around because they were divorced. But that is until um... no, no that, that's that's not what it was. I'll tell you what it was. So it's a funny story. So here's a problem we always had with Rugrats. We had all these babies from all these different families, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And they had to be in the same place at the same time in order for us to do stories. So we were always trying to, and, and babies can't get someplace on their own, you know, so usually they'd end up at, at Tommy's house, and so Tommy'd be there, and, and you know, Tommy and Angelica are, are cousins, so, so Tommy's uncle, Drew, would bring over Angelica, and she'd be there, and Betty was their next-door neighbor, so she'd bring over their babies, and, and, and they'd be there, you know, mm -hmm. well, and, you know, Betty's husband would be there, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had this, we had Chucky, who would just be there, you know? Just be there. Right. And so we, we kind of worked backwards and we said, okay, well, there's a there's a dad and he's called Charles Sr., Chuck Sr., right? Yeah. And you remember Chuck Sr. He's a kind of a fun character on the show. But he came about, it's like the the the, uh, the baby begat the father in that in that sense. Uh, and uh. so, so um, you know, so Charles Sr. would come over and bring over Chucky. Initially, we just created that character in order to have an adult that would bring over the baby, right? Yeah. But then people started saying, okay, well, we know that Tommy has this mom and dad, you know, uh, uh, Stu and Dee Dee, and we know that Angelica has her, has her dad, Drew, and then we pretty quickly came up with Drew's, you know, with Angelica's mother. You remember her? Yes, of and course. Then, then we had, yeah. but what, you know, but what about... You know, and then there was there was Betty, the mom, and, and all that. But who was Chucky's mom? You know, and so we sat there and said, "Well, she's not around. We've never met her. She's clearly you, you, we've set up that Charles Senior is single, right? Mm -hmm. So where is the mom, right?" And so I remember I had a discussion with people where I said, "Okay, well, there are two possibilities: either they're divorced, <laughs> or his mom's dead. One right. of the two, right? Right." And so. We said, what do people like more? And so initially we thought, well, let's do that they're divorced because that's, you know, less heavy. So let's do that they're divorced. And then people said, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that because we don't want to have to talk about divorce on this show. So well, let's not do divorce. And I said, 
Okay, well then maybe she's dead. Oh no, no, you don't want to do that. She's dead. <laughs> and so we found ourselves in this bind where we couldn't say either one, so we dropped it. Wow. So during the entire first sixty-five half hours of Rugrats, which were from about what was it, nineteen ninety to nineteen ninety-two or ninety-three, something like that. Yeah. Well, the initial run that I where I had created it and I ran the show. We just didn't deal with Chucky's mom at all. It never came up, right? Oh. Because oh. we purposely didn't bring it up. Yes, um, there have been a few instances in which it has been brought up that Chucky did have a mom. In the episode, Real or Robots, and uh, Chucky versus the Potty, and I believe in the episode, The Barbecue, you actually got to see her, I believe? The, the woman with the red hair? Or was that somebody else? I don't think that was somebody else. Mm, um, she got mentioned, with, yeah, a couple of times the writers would sneak a mention of her into the show as a joke. Oh. You know, someone would mention her and then say something kind of cryptic that you couldn't follow and you go, huh, what was that? And we did it on purpose because we, we were not allowed to talk about it. And in the Mother's Day episode, oh my god. Oh. The Mother's Day episode oh. was, was not part of the original 65 half hour run. That was part wow. of the second series. I wasn't even, Joe and I were not even involved with that. Uh, here's oh, what happened. Okay. We, we finished with the show in, like I said, in about 1992, I think is when, when when I finished the, the 65 half hour run, yeah. I left the show to move on to do other things. And Joe had already long been gone by then. The other writers were gone too. And we left the show. They had 65 half hours, which was a magic number in those days. If you could get to 65 half hours, you had enough to syndicate. Mm -hmm. And so every, you know, Nickelodeon said, okay, we got 65 by everybody. And that was that. Oh. And that was from about, so that's like, like I say, around 1992, 93, somewhere in there. And then, in 1995, long after we were gone and all moved on to doing other things, Nickelodeon decided to put the show in prime time. They started a prime time uh, program. And they mm -hmm. put the show in there at 7 o'clock, I think, or 7.30, I'm not sure. I believe so, and yeah. And then they also gone. actually featured it on SNCC a couple of times. Okay, so then it suddenly took off. And by that time, I was off the show, Joe was off the show, all the people who worked on those, you know, Steve, all the people that had been anything to do with the first series, the writers and I, were all gone. We were all moved on to other things. We never came back to the series. It was done by other people after in 1995. So the entire second run of the series where, you know, that character Dill is in there, and right. that girl Kimmy, I think is her yeah, name, Kimmy. I don't know. Yeah, um, all that stuff was after us. We we had nothing to do with that. So that okay. Mother's Day episode where it gets, you know, this, and I, I, I don't really know the episode that, that well, but it's kind of a heavy episode about the mom dying. Yes. And Chuck dealing with, that was all after we were gone. Okay. We were, not, we were not allowed to talk about it during the first wow. season. Oh, interesting. Um, do you have any other questions, Kev? Do you have uh, any questions, um, Well, I'm just curious. Um in what you think might be some of the innate differences in terms of writing for animation versus, you know, writing for something live action, do you think there is a difference? Like, how how do you feel that would work? Well, some people, I'm, I'm going to give you two answers to that. Some people produce animated shows and write for animation in this kind of gag-oriented way, which is more like, you could think of it as like the old Warner Brothers style <laughs> where, Mm -hmm. You're just telling a bunch of gags, and usually those were put together not by writers, but by animators doing storyboards. So the, the right. story was figured out in the storyboard phase. Mm -hmm. and those shows are very, very different from live action. Nobody does that in live action that I've ever played. Right. right. Uh, the it's way understandable. Did, I'm sorry? I said it's understandable. The way we did Rugrats and Recess that Joe and I did and the way they did Arnold and the way we did The Simpsons and all those shows are script-driven shows. And so the writers are usually live-action writers. They, almost everybody was who worked on my shows. Mm -hmm. and they would go and they would write a script the same way you would write um, a live-action show. And when I say the same way, I mean more like in the movie style. You know, our scripts look like movie scripts in the sense right. that they're, you know, sitcoms have a certain format and and say one hour shows or movies have a different format, we would do it in the movie format. And those episodes would be written like uh, a live action show, and we thought of them as live action shows. Mm -hmm. So I would say, for us, there is no difference. We yeah. were okay. between live action and animation. 
Yeah, um, another question that I wanted to ask um, now that, you know, when, when discussing about Rugrats and, you know, just recently, I believe it was uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, another thing that I found really interesting about Rugrats was that, you know, unlike a lot of kids shows at the time, they celebrated different holidays that was not Christmas or Halloween. They also celebrated Jewish holidays. And you, of course, being Jewish and Arlene being Jewish as well, uh, what made you decide that, you know, you wanted to showcase Passover to a general audience? Well, there's a funny story there. What happened was, initially we did a Christmas episode of Rugrats. Mm -hmm. And the, the Santa and, experience, and, and, yes. Well, that was great, and everybody loved it. And Nickelodeon called us and said, hey, you know, we were just thinking, what if we did, we did a Christmas episode, what if we did a, a Hanukkah episode? Hmm. And... A lot of the writers on the staff, as you say, were Jewish. I, I'm, Joe isn't Jewish, but I, I'm Jewish. Arlene wasn't really a writer on the show. She didn't have that much to do with any of that stuff. But there was a guy named Jonathan Greenberg who was on the show. There was Rachel Lippman was on the show. A few of us. And we all got together to talk about it. And we all said, you know, in Judaism, the important holiday is not Hanukkah. Hanukkah was kind of a minor holiday in Judaism and only became an important holiday as as a way of competing with Christmas. I don't know if you guys know that, but it's true. Right. Um, and, yeah. And and really the important holiday of Judaism is is Passover. And so we called Nickelodeon and said, hey, you know, if you want to do an interesting episode that's kind of parallel to to Christmas, but for, for Jewish people, the thing to do is not to do a, a Hanukkah episode, but to do a Passover episode. And we said okay, great, do a Passover episode. And so we did the Passover episode, which was a giant hit, and it's still shown in synagogues, and people still watch it at Passover. It was, it was a real coup for us. It was great. Yeah, I may not be Jewish, but I actually love the Passover episode. Oh, me too. I love the Passover. And I learned everything I know about Passover from that episode, <laughs> just so you know. Well, thank you. I'm really glad you guys had that. I definitely learned a lot. Definitely. Yeah. But, the interesting thing is that we never did a Hanukkah episode during the first 65 half hours. And then when they picked it up for the second 65 half hours in 1995, they did a Hanukkah episode. We had nothing to do with that. The Passover episode's the one that went like. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, I, I hope you guys don't mind, but I like to shift over to Recess, which that was oh, the second yeah, one that you created. Which I just have one quick, can I just ask one quick question? Sure, go ahead. I'm Kevin. so sorry. Um, have you met any of the voice actors on the shows you've worked on in Nickelodeon? Yes, I directed all of the voices on all of the, oh. just every single episode I uh, that we did on Rugrats and Recess and Lloyd in Space. And the shows that I worked on, I directed the voices, almost all of them. Oh my God. So I didn't direct so I cast them and direct, directed them all. Oh, wow. How was Michael Bell? I'm sorry to ask you that. Michael Bell's great. He's a I love character. Michael Bell. He's <laughs> a so really funny guy. I, I saw him the other night at a restaurant here in Los Angeles. I haven't seen him in years. Oh, oh wow. Very Really, really skilled actor. Really wonderful to work with. I, I loved him. He's great. Oh yeah, especially when he was like on Transformers and Challenge of the Super Friends. And I love, I mean, I love Rugrats as a whole. But I love him as Drew and Chaz and Grandpa Boris. I love that. He didn't play Chaz. He didn't play Chaz. Oh, he didn't play Chaz? Who played Chaz? Oh, that, that was Phil Proctor played Chaz. Oh. oh. Was, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Fire Sign Theater. Have you ever heard of them? No. No. The, the Fire Sign Theater, look them up. They're, they're a comedy group from the 60s and 70s, and I was a oh. huge fan of theirs. Oh. And I, I cast Phil from being a fan of that of that comedy group, which, no, you, you know, it's kind of my generation. Younger people don't remember them anymore, but they, they still do stuff occasionally. Oh, that's cool. cool. When we're discussing about recess, when I saw it when I was very young, I thought to myself, you know, this is kind of like what Rugrats is, except for an older crowd. And yeah. it, but also, I kind of felt it was kind of like a mixture of the adventures of Pete and Pete in there and Hey Arnold, in which yeah. it's kind of like a strange, surreal perspective of a kid, but at the same time, it's totally relatable. And I felt that, you know, this was kind of like an interesting take about, you know, how kids were in recess because, you know, with recess, you get to go outside, you get to be free, you get to play games. But at the same time, you have these digger boys, you have the king who's in sixth grade, you have the Ashleys who are all named Ashley and they're the popular kids. And then you have Randall, the weasel who hangs out with Miss Finster. 
which I think that may be Miss Finster and then Chucky Finster. I don't know. That's a coincidence. It may be. I don't know, but yeah. still. It's, it's sort of halfway a coincidence and halfway on purpose, but good, good catch there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, so um, what parts of, um, of Recess did you ha heavily wanted to work on and, you know, parts that Paul wanted to work on and the other writers? You know, there's a story I heard once. Uh, it, it, no, I don't mean to digress, but this will this will make sense in a second. I, I heard a story once about um, Howard Hawks going to see um, High Noon. I don't know if you know these movies, these old. Westerns. Of course, yeah, yeah, I know about High Noon. Uh, I have yeah. a good friend of mine from uh, the site that I post, Manic Expression, who's a huge fan of westerns, and he actually talked about it a lot on High Noon. Yeah, well, he so Howard Hawks, who was a famous old director, went to go see High Noon. And he and he got mad, and he said, "That's not the way a sheriff would act. A sheriff wouldn't go around begging people to help him. I don't believe that. I hate that. I'm going to make a movie with John Wayne. That's how I think a sheriff would act, where everybody comes to him and says, "Can we help you, sheriff?" And he says, "No." And so he went off and made a movie called Rio Bravo, which is one of my favorite movies. So the thing is, I love High Noon, and I love Rio Bravo. And I, when I heard that story, I thought that's interesting. That that's how I feel about Arnold and Recess, you know? How I feel about Hey Arnold is that I was not feeling like I wanted... I kept saying, like, Torvald's a good example. That's, like, one of the last things I was trying. It's like, no, guys, really, let's do shows about, you know, what it is to be a kid, you know? And Steve and Craig and then Joe Purdy were kind of coming in and going, no, let's take it off in this other tangent. Now, let me say, just one quick thing, one of my very favorite Steve Vixton episodes, and this was sort of towards the end, and also... This isn't the entire story, but just creatively, because there was also stuff happening with Mary Harrington and Vince Calandra, and I felt like I wasn't being backed up, and all this kind of stuff that's political, you know? So one of my very favorite episodes of Arnold is Oscars in Love, or whatever it's called. And that episode, when we read it, I remember reading it. It was completely a Steve script. I was very supportive of it, and it's like an old Odd Couple episode or something. It's just like a really just well-written episode, and we read it aloud... And I said to Steve, this is maybe the best thing you've ever written. I mean, it's really, really good. And I could tell Steve really appreciated it. But I also thought, i got to get out of here because this is not what I think the show should be. I don't think we should be going down this direction. I mean, it's not that I think, you know, I don't hate it. I would stay. I could have been happy. But I feel like I was being the prudish one. Do you know what I mean? Like I was the one writing the Torvald episodes. I kept saying, like there was one I wrote about um, – Arnold and his baseball that I really liked. Oh, the these, baseball. I really like that episode. But all those were more kid-like, you know? And I think if I'd stayed on the show, I think Arnold, I think I probably would have kept that balance a little better, you know? I kind of would have put more shows about what it is to be a kid in there. But that doesn't mean the show was better. It just went in this other direction. It went more towards Craig and Steve, you know? Or more towards Steve and then Craig along with him, you know? But... Um, as far as the writing, because really the show is Craig's show. I mean, the show, Arnold is Craig, you know. But anyway, around that time, Paul was saying, you know, hey, let's get something else going. And there was a project we had called Mighty Girl, and these people at CBS wanted it. And so I left. I left the show to go make the show Mighty Girl, right? Well, we started making Mighty Girl, and it became clear to me that CBS was going to, you know, wreck it. And they kind of were... And so we kept writing scripts and pilots, and eventually Mighty Girl ended up becoming nothing. And too bad, still one of my favorite things. But um, mo around that time, one night in the middle of the night, I woke up and I said, I thought, you know what Arnold should have been? It should have been just, it should have been called The Recess Gang, and it should have taken place all at school. And, I, and it should have just been all the kids who I knew as a kid in recess because that's where all my favorite stories took place in my life, you know? And so I wrote that down on a piece of paper and forgot about it. These guys at Disney called Paul cause they said, Hey, cause by now, now Rugrats was becoming a hit. The first uh, episodes were being rediscovered basically. And so these guys at Disney called and they said, Hey Paul, will you come in? We'll let you do anything you want. And we kind of didn't believe them. So we went in there and we pitched them a bunch of ideas that we thought that they would like better. And then sort of the last minute when we said, oh, and we also have this idea called recess. And they said, that's it. That's what we want. Well, they didn't know about Arnold at this point because Arnold hadn't been on the air yet, right? So I kept saying to them, you know, there's this show called Arnold and <laughs> it's got similarities. And they were like, no, no, no. And like I said, as the show went on, it they evolved into different directions anyway, so it didn't matter. But 
the thing about Recess was that was different to me than Arnold was that it was really trying to imagine what it was like to be like a regular kid in school. Not a not. I think Arnold is more about being the oddball. Do you know what I mean? Um, Arnold is more like being the weird creative kid, which is why I think kids really do get into it. Like, you know, I think why so many people like it and why Steve liked it, you know, is because that's how Steve felt. You know, he felt like an outsider all the time. And I think Arnold, I mean, I think Recess is more about like, you know, your friends, like a group of regular friends who hang out together, you know, which was more my childhood. So it's a little bit of a happier childhood. And it also had this sort of 1960s attitude, which comes from both from me and Paul, which was that the the adults are trying to keep you down. You know, they're trying to, like, hold you in. And then the other thing that we added on to it, which I really liked, was this idea of magical realism, which is something, ironically, as I criticize Arnold and, and Stoop Kid, you know, which is, like you said, one of your favorite episodes, it was that element of magic that even though I thought, oh, I don't know if Arnold wants to go that direction, I did recognize that there was something great in the anim- in watching it animated. Like, I remember watching the birds all pick up Stoop Kid in the animatic and thinking, I mean, uh, not Stoop Kid. Uh, Pigeon Man. Pigeon Man. And thinking, wow, that looks pretty cool. Now, so, in a way, you could say, you know, if it was John Christalusi listening to this, they'd say, yeah, you idiot writers, that's why you should always be guys who know about animation when you sit down. But, Oof. <laughs> in, a way, but in a way, it was kind of neat to kind of discover that. And so when we did Recess, we, just, we said we wanted it to be real, So all the designs and everything had to be real. Like, if you fell down and you hurt yourself, but we wanted to have elements of it that were magical all the way through, which is why the kindergartners and the swinger girl and and the King Bob and everything were, like, a little bit beyond real. Because we saw that that could be cool. Like, it would be a cool place to go. And then as far as where the characters all came from, they every character, every single character was based on somebody in either my past or Paul's past. Every single one of them. And so they felt real more real to me you know to you know for me you know as much as i love like helga for example i never felt she was real you know i felt she was like a compilation she was really funny i know she was real to steve and again this may be why i ended up leaving the show you know right i know i know she was real to craig and i know she was real to steve but she always kind of seemed like a little bit fake to me but all the characters that I knew, all the characters I knew of my childhood or, or somebody in Paul's childhood, those were the six main characters. Gretchen was based on Paul's wife, who he knew as a kid. Oh, wow. And, and, and if you see a picture of Paul's wife, it looks exactly like Gretchen, you know, and you're like, wow, you know. Um, Spinelli was, was based on a person that both Paul and I knew in college named Spinelli. And she was the coolest chick we ever met. We were like, wow, what would she have been like as a kid, you know. The main character, um, TJ, was based on my best friend who's named JP, who I've remained friends with since, you know, kindergarten, and is like this weird little chubby fat hero. And, you know, I don't know what else to call him, but that's what he is. He's a guy who always stands up for people. He's just a great guy, you know. Vince was based on Paul's friend from elementary school, and, um, oh, and Mikey was based on my brother Louie, you know, and another guy that I knew from elementary school kind of combo. And then the littlest, uh, the youngest guy, uh, Gus, the, the guy who's always the new kid, was kind of based on me and Paul. That's how we saw each other, you know? That's how we saw ourselves, because we used to move around a lot when we were kids. This is probably the thing that unites all of these shows together, is that we had a group of writers that we all, all three shows, Rugrats, Hey Arnold, and Recess, all drew on a lot of the same writers. And by the time we got to Arnold, I mean to Recess, you know, we had probably a dozen writers that we would go to and say, hey, we're doing a show about school. Can you, you know, write down your favorite 20 stories and send them to us, you know? And the same, I know Craig and Steve were doing the same thing, and, and we did the same thing. So there were people like Holly Huckins and Rachel Lipman and Peter Gaffney and Mike Ferris and John Greenberg and all these people that we were all using. And you see their names on all those shows, you know? So, I mean, and these guys, so in, that, in the case of Recess, that's what we did. That we, said, we put out a call. We said, get us your best stories of childhood. Of, of What do you remember from your teachers and all that kind of stuff? And that's where so many stories came from. It's crazy. And then the other thing we did is we started interviewing kids, you know, and saying, hey, hey you know, what do you, you know, what's going on in school now? Like, so there was an episode called The Box, for example, about kids being, where a kid got um, 
put in a box in a square on the on the sidewalk for being or, you know on the playground for being bad. Yeah, and then TJ when he was put into the box at first, he didn't think that it, there was any big deal about it, and then he started going mentally insane. Yeah, and we we actually we were in, we were talking to some kids, some like little kids, and they said, yeah, you know, in our school they put us in the box, and we thought. Oh my God! You know, we thought it was like a metal box, you know, like a sweat box, like Cool Hand Luke or something. And they goes, "It's terrible." And they were describing it to us, and we were like, "What kind of horrible teachers are they?" And then they told us, when, and then finally, we, as they were describing it, it, was like, "Oh, you mean it's painted on the ground?" They go, "Yeah, it's terrible. You can't go." And we thought, "Oh my God, let's play that like Cool Hand Luke." You know, let's play it like it's the metal box. You know, so that's kind of where we were coming from on that show, and. You know, that, for me, that was like the happiest time of my life because I was doing what I wanted to do, you know, and I was doing the show I wanted to do and all that kind of stuff. As far as, I should say, happiest time, you know, professionally. Of course, of course. <laughs> I've happier times in regular life. But, but, um, but oh, you know, that doesn't take away from any of the other things. I, I do think a lot of creativity comes from the struggle and the difference of opinions, you know. And I'm glad to see that Arnold is, has had such a giant, revival on the internet especially you know um and i think that's fantastic because it is a it it is a great great show it's just that it was a very painful experience for me so when i think back at it and partly it was because of my relationship with steve was falling apart well and our, fr and our friendship was was it wasn't pretty like we were coming in and kind of fighting with each other a lot you know Right. So, well, I, I apologize if I brought up anything to. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't don't feel that at all. I, I actually like. I just want to get the record straight on it all because I think that I I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, another thing that I really found interesting was that you know, unlike with um, Rugrats, um, I believe that for the most part you casted real kids for a recess. That's right. And you so know, we'll and what did you? What made you decide to cast like real kids for a recess as opposed to like adults, with, with the exception of um, the wonderfully talented Pamela Adlon who did Spinelli? Oh, she's she's one of my. I love working with her. Oh, she's, she's just, amazing. Yeah. It's the answer to your question. It's a, it's interesting that you that you asked that because that was a very intentional decision. So, so here's the thing. Now think about it. There's no way. That we could possibly have cast real babies to play in Rugrats. That's true. <laughs> so, we, when we were doing Rugrats, we knew that you know it it, it, it is it is such a pretend thing it, it, that that babies can talk and what they would sound like that we sort of had license to do it the way we wanted. And the thing about it is, is that you know we didn't have that verisimilitude. We didn't have to make you believe that that um, these were real kids because you knew that they, they can't possibly be real babies. So there was no reason why we had to go with real kids. And it's easier to work with adults. Um, they're more skilled. They're more trained. Uh, you, can, you can go much faster. There are all kinds of financial reasons why it's easier. It's just, it's just if you can do it, it's better. It's, it's more fun to do that way. Um, or at, at least it's easier. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. When we got to recess, we really wanted it to sound like real kids, right? We we wanted we were sick of all these you know these these uh, people play, you know that you, you hear these shows where there's an adult playing a kid and you can kind of tell and it's sort of a, you kind of go oh, you kind of roll your eyes that doesn't sound real at all. We thought let's go for reality here, and so we cast real kids, but it was hard. It was hard because the kids were. Were very young. It was hard to keep. The, it was hard for them to concentrate. They didn't have the actors, the actors' chops that an older actor would have, and so it was. They were long sessions, and there was a lot of editing to make it all work. But in the end, it sounded really good. I think, and, and sounded very real, yeah. and it was fun to do. Um, but the other problem we had with it was every year we'd come back. You know, we'd, we'd be off for our hiatus, and we'd come back to do the next season. And half the boys, their voices would have changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> That's <a> <laughs> that happened there. I don't know if you guys realize it, but there were three TJs. Yes, like, um, I I did like, realize that because Arnold in a bit. They kind of changed. Oh, yeah. yeah, they changed. Yeah, Ar they changed. Both, yeah, they changed. That's Arnold's, right. Um, Same thing happened to Craig because if you're working with real kids, you have to recast it. Just especially with the boys, the girls, it's not as big of a problem. Right. But the boys, their voices change, and it's like you can't use them anymore. So that happened. Over and over again with several of the characters. Yeah, definitely. Um, so so it, it has its ups and its downs, but it gave us more of a real, you know, like a believable, real quality. That's why we did it on on um, Recess. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, you have any questions, Kev? 
Oh, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I love recess when it was on Saturday mornings. It was, I have to say, what I, you know what I liked about recess, and I, I say the same thing about Arnold, and you know, with, even with the rug, Rugrats, was that on, uh, you know, on Saturday mornings, I mean, you had so many uh, classic cartoons, but recess, it was real. Like it, it dealt with real problems mm-hmm. and stuff, and I, and a lot of kids could relate to that. Like you know, with Gus, there was always that one kid that was always scared of anything. TJ, you always had anarchy. Like he was, the, you know, the troublemaker. Vince was always athletic, and Gretchen was the nerdy girl, and Spinelli was the tomboy, and of course, Mikey. I, I don't know. I love Mikey. Mikey's just a perfect <laughs> character on its own. So I mean, Reese's was just like the one cartoon on Saturday mornings where you actually felt like you were watching. A, a real show with people dealing with real problems, and it was such a nice break away from that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I at least I thought of it. At least I got out of it. Um, one of my that was that was very intentional. We did that on purpose. Yeah. We wanted, you know, one of the things. You know, honestly, I'll tell you a funny story. You know, so Joe had worked. I didn't work on A. Arnold, but Joe did. Yeah. Right? And and Steve Vixton, who we talked about earlier, he also worked on on A. Arnold. Um, and Joe and I were had been had been partners, and then we kind of took a break, and he was working on Hey Arnold. And he sort of he finished with the show, and he came to me and he said, "You know, Arnold was a great show, but he wanted to tell stories that felt a little more real." You know, we talked about the fact that you know, like ten and eleven year old kids don't really have these romantic urges that they talked about. We wanted to do kind of like what would it, what's it really like to be ten years old? What does it feel? Like, you know. And so we created this ensemble with different characters that are that. This is something Joe and I always love to do. Is we keep we have a group of characters that are all different and all very very different from each other and kind of interact in funny ways. And on recess, they were sort of unlikely friends. Like you, you imagine the the athletic guy and the tricky kind of jokester guy and the the kind of intellectual nerdy girl and the kind of you know the big guy who's kind of a softy and. Yeah. The top guy. They don't necessarily all fit together in the real world, but in recess, they were all friends. They were all friends. And their lives happened at recess. And we thought it was kind of the, the what, we, what we used to pitch to people is, well, Rugrats is about you're a little baby and you're discovering the world and it's all exciting and new and cool. Recess is about how now you're 10, you know the world, it's a scary place, how do you survive? Yeah, and what I appreciate is that your writing, you never condescended to kids. Like, you wrote childhood and, you know, recess as important. You took it seriously. You know, you dealt, you actually did take that time to deal with these real issues and not only that but made it relatable to where it was watchable for you know everyone not just kids so that's i think a really important feat in and of itself well you know part of that came from instead of writing what we thought kids were like you know which i think a lot of people do they say well i'm going to write a show about kids and they think well what do our kids like you know and instead of doing that we thought Hey, we were kids once. What was it like for us? Exactly right. <laughs> so Joe is brilliant at that. He, he's really connected to his childhood and his childhood, you know, his he, he, his brothers and his life when he was a kid. And he's really good at telling stories and remembering how it felt. And that's how we always told those stories. That was true on Rugrats and Recess, you know? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. that we were telling stories that we could remember. Because on Rugrats, you know, you, you think... Oh, well, these are stories about little babies. Well, the fact of the matter is they're not really stories about little babies. They're kind of stories about toddlers, you know, or, <laughs> or nursery school age kids, more than they are about little infants. Because little infants, what are their stories? You know, you know it's hard to yeah. say. <laughs> so we kind of faked it. It's kind of a fake out. Recess is, is really what's it like to be 10. Mm-hmm. And those characters that you talked about, like the diggers and, you know, and the king of the playground and, uh-huh. and, and the Ashleys and all that, are kind of exaggerations of our own memories of what it was like to be a little kid. So, you know, you got kindergartners and they seem like little savages to you. Well, what if they really are little savages, you know? <laughs> and, and so we, we kind of thought of it as the, the magical realism version of TV, mm-hmm. you know, where the things that you, you kind of take it to the next level of unreality. So if there's a, a world of reality and then right outside it, it gets more and more unreal as you go circles farther and farther away from the main characters. 
uh, another question I wanted to ask, uh, going back to Recess, was um, were you and Paul like really heavily involved with the movies as well as the um, the TV show? Because there were, I believe, three movies that came out for Recess. The first one, which was theatrical, Recess School's Out, and then there were a couple of ones like, you know, when they were kindergartners, and then when TJ and the gang went to the fifth grade and their teacher was Miss Finster. We were involved with the first movie. Um, and then that was it. We didn't have anything to do with any of the other ones. Um, the one that's called Schools Out was pretty much ours, I would say. Okay. Uh, I kind of, I kind of see that because I, I really love Schools Out and, you know, no disrespect to Craig or anything, but I actually like Schools Out much better than Hey Arnold the movie. Yeah. Well, me too. I agree with you. I think, I think Hey Arnold the movie didn't really work that well. No, it didn't. I, I know the story behind it that it was supposed to be a TV movie, but then the first two Rugrats movies did so successfully in the box office. They wanted it to be the, they wanted the TV movie to be the theatrical one. And then, um, the jungle movie was supposed to be the next one. I, I get, I know the story, but I really want to know more about schools out because I really like that movie. I really like the way that they were try the, you know, the guy was trying to, you know, change summer and he, he wanted it to be like all year round because he felt that the students weren't being intelligent enough and you get to see more Principal Prickly as a character and how even though that he's always strict a lot, he's, you know, he's actually really caring for kids about how and then how the kids kind of united with one another. Well, I'll tell you the story quickly about that one. And one quick thing before you, I tell you that is you brought up Pr Principal Prickly and Miss Finster and I forgot to mention them as characters real quickly. They both of our fathers were teachers, high school teachers. So. We had, both of us were, like, worried all the time. I was like, uh-oh, Dad's going to be mad when he sees this shit that we're saying this mean thing about teachers. And also, uh, the guy who designed the characters, of uh, our original characters, they didn't end up actually making, because it's hard, when you get a designer, it's hard to um, get them to actually make that animatable, right? It's hard. That's two different things, you know, like, but um, the guy who we did our original concept was a guy named, um, Dave Shannon, who's a very famous children's book writer and illustrator, and he designed. And so we told him. I had a, a teacher. He he just would design it, and you go off and you go. That's the person I was looking. That's exactly what I was describing to you. Amazing design uh, character designer. Anyway, so on with Miss Finster, I had a teacher named Mrs. Jutilla, and she was this big giant lady, bigger than life, and she would just you know yell, "Get out of the hallway! Get out of the hallway!" She had this big <laughs> voice like that, you know, and. But but she turned out to always be really sweet, like if you got to know her later in life, you know. So anyway, um, I described Mrs. Jutilla to him, to Dave, and Dave said, oh, I know who you're talking about. You're talking about this other woman, whatever her name, Mrs. Smith or whatever. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. And he came back and he drew, he drew, I swear to God, he must have had a picture of Mrs. Jutilla because that's who Miss Finster was, you know. And we were like, wow, you know. So... Um, which was just a sign to us that these characters were universal, you know, that people all over the world would look at someone like Miss Finster and think, I have that teacher somewhere, you know. But um, what happened in the movie was, I'll tell you, the interesting thing about the movie is Disney decided the re same thing. You know, the Recess movie comes out, it's a big hit, and Disney decided, we need to make a movie. And we weren't finished with our first 65 on the se on the series of... of of um, recess, which honestly, I think I don't love the last, you know, thirteen or so. I'm just I'm just being honest with you. Of recess, I felt like we lost control a little bit of the show because we couldn't do both the movie and the series. You know, so there are episodes that I watch that are okay, and I know people love them. Like you get online and people go, "This is my favorite episode," but I go, "I just didn't like this which one." I think TJ was becoming a little too mean for me. You know. He was becoming a little too macho, you know, because I never thought of TJ as macho. I thought of him as kind of almost the cool dude, you know. But anyway, um, but what happened was Disney came to us and they said, we want you to make a movie. And we said to them, and Paul will remember this. I'm sure if you asked him about it, I'm sure he'd say the same thing. We said to them, guys, we wanted to do a show about all the little things that happen on the playground, but make them big. So... It's just about the kindergartners, but it's bigger than life because they're kindergartners, you know? It's not about, it's how you see this little world and you imagine it bigger than it is. But if we make a movie, we have to make it big. It's going to fuck up our show. I'm sorry. It's no, 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 it's, it's, okay. it's okay. It's going to mess up our entire take on what our idea is. And they said, and we argued with them for months. I don't know if Paul told you this. No, no, he didn't. We, said, we don't want to make a movie. 
Because a movie has to be big, and we know you're going to want to make this bigger, and whatever we come up with, you're going to want to make it bigger. And they said, and finally this executive, who is, I won't name him, he ended up not being there very long, he said to us, here's the deal, <laughs> Joe. Either you can make the movie, or someone else can make the movie. Because we're making a movie. So if you want to be involved, you have to jump on. So what happened is that Paul and I kind of tried to do both things at once and it didn't work very well and Paul kind of took over eventually the movie but and and did the movie and then I kind of basically that movie I would say production wise the way it looks the way it's acted and everything that's Paul's movie Paul and Chuck Sheets did it together but it was the director but Paul was the guy who just you know like every he just wrote it and I think it turned out really well the problem was okay and so then we went to a guy named john greenberg who's an old friend of ours from rugrats days who had used to start out as our assistant you know and then he ended up becoming a really good friend and a good writer and really all three of us together although anyway why we didn't all take credit on it i don't know but anyway we all three of us together worked out this story we knew it had to be big and so we said it's going to have to be a james bond movie i mean you know i mean because because we knew, I mean, in a movie, it's like, I think that's part of the problem with Craig's movie. It's like, wrecking the neighborhood's not enough. It's got to be big. It's a movie. But we had to, like, figure out a way to make it really big and really small at the same time, you know? So we said, what could be big, but what could be the small thing that's the funny joke of it all? Like, could we do something that's bigger than Recess and bigger than the Playground and all that stuff, but then at the same time, make it about what the themes of Recess are? So we... we had this idea again coming off of rugrats you know like what does the light go off in the refrigerator when you open the door like all the things you think and we so we had this idea of like well, what are they doing in the school during summer what happens in there and i remember thinking when i was a kid i'll bet they're doing some experiments in there you know <laughs> i'll bet they're doing something bad in there you know and so we had that idea and then the next thing we had was this idea of and so we were kind of playing with that, and the writer, John Greenberg, was saying, well, what if, you know, what if it's this, and what if it's that, and what it, but it always turns to be nothing. And I said, no, we've got to make it something. And one of us, it may have been me, it may have been John, said, or maybe been Paul, actually, in this case, because we were all on the phone together, said, well, what if the, the roof, I almost feel like the roof of the school should open up and a giant laser beam should shoot out. And I said, that would be great. There was an old um, Peter Sellers Pink Panther movie, I think it, it's, I think it's Pink Panther Strikes Again, where that happens, and it's really funny. Like, the guy's trying to, like, make everybody disappear with his laser beam. And we thought, well, what could you make disappear? I mean, okay, let's say that's really happening. At first, Paul was against it. He said, no, I don't want to go this big. And I said, Paul, it's, we have to be a movie. If, we're gonna, if they're, they're making it a movie, it's got to be a movie, and movies are big. So we said, what could they be destroying? What could they be trying to destroy? And and it happened. There were, we used to have a, an educational consultant who I really loved this guy. He was this southerner, this guy from North Carolina named John Arnold. And he would get on the phone and he would send me these articles. And he would send me this article somewhere along the line about these people in some school district in the south or the east or something who wanted to get rid of recess because they said recess was of no use to education and i thought oh my god wouldn't that be crazy to do that you know with these little kids it's like people who don't have children coming up with ideas like yeah let's keep them locked up longer to to drive us all crazy you know so um we said what if that what if it's some crazy guy who really wants to do some educator who's gone rogue and then when we had the idea of it's a rogue educator we just laughed we just thought that's funny now you've made it a james bond movie but it's just you know william bennett or something Although I love the movie, I feel like it kind of hurt our TV show. Which So I have mixed feelings about it because I feel like eventually the movie kept taking more and more of our energy and we had to turn away from it. And we kind of turned the writing of the show over to other people. you know. So I, I feel like the la there are episodes I don't even know from the last – I shouldn't say I don't know them, but I don't, I'm not as familiar with them. And people will mention them to me. I'll go, oh, yeah. Um, and some of them are really funny, like – there was one called This Womps, you know, it was about this invented word, you know, and I really liked that episode, but it just felt, a it kind of felt to me a little bit like it was, like wasn't my TJ, you know, he was acting a little bit overly macho is the best word I can say. He was overly aggressive, you know? Yeah. Thought, That's not the guy I, I liked, you know? I mean, it, you know, your main characters are always your problem, you know, at these shows. But anyway, so that's the story of that movie. I mean, I, I love the movie. I love what it was. We have lots of stories about what happened on that movie. 
you know, we, we had originally the bad guy was going to be played by Burt Reynolds and there's all sorts of good stories on that. But, um, yeah, you know, that's what, that's what the story of that movie is. Oh, wow. That's really interesting, Joe. All right. Um, I guess we can wrap things up regarding about, um, you know, discussing about these programs, because I'm sure we can go all day about this. You know. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, um, you know, one final question that, you know, I wanted to ask and, um, you know, I guess, you know, this will probably be um, a good one to end it with. But these shows have lasted, you know, for almost, you know, a few years. And then, you know, as time goes on and you see about how much of a big impact it left on people. I mean, how does that make you feel? as a creator and as a writer and as a producer? It's really exciting uh, because one of the things, you know, I've been asked to speak at, at colleges a couple of times about Rugrats and Recess, and the thing that's always kind of amazing to me is you, a lot of you guys, I, I don't know how old you guys are specifically, but you, you, you seem to be, like, I would guess you're in your 20s. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, what's happened is the kids who were, you know, little kids watching our shows back in the 90s are now coming of age, you guys are in college, and it's kind of a kick to have people come up to us and yeah. say, you, you animated my childhood, you know, that's you really, really exciting yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm figuring you guys are going to be taking over Hollywood so soon, maybe you'll give me a job, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. So it's really exciting to, to know that you had an influence on people's lives. Absolutely. Okay, aside, it's really cool. It's, it's really wonderful. It's a really good feeling. I've thought about this a lot lately because um, around 2000, probably as much because of my own personal life, but but also because I think things changed, I found myself sort of out of work. You know, I mean, I've worked the whole time, but I don't feel like I've ever done my own stuff again. You know, it's like, and I kind of feel like what happened was the executives and the companies and maybe the audience too just didn't want what we did anymore, you know? And I know all, I, I have, you know, I just had lunch with Joe Murray. I don't know if you know Joe Murray. Yeah, the creator of Rocco's Modern Life. Yeah. And he was saying the same thing. It's just, it's really hard. And maybe it's just because we got old. I don't know. There was a period anyway where they just didn't want what we made anymore. They didn't want shows that were really about kids. They wanted shows about sponges, you know. They wanted <laughs> shows about, they wanted shows. And, and, you know, nothing against Spongebob. Hilarious show. But it's not what I do, you know. So... There was a long period where I didn't do that, and then I, I I wrote lots of other things, you know. And like I said, I've been writing on all the whole time. I'm writing on shows now, but um, but then there was this period, and then in the, say around 2006, 2007, I started teaching, you know, and I taught at Fullerton some writing classes, and I met tons of kids who would go, "What you did that? Oh my God, that was my favorite thing," you know, and we would talk about it, and 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 I kind of. I didn't know what you were doing, and then years later, I didn't know what the reference was, and then years later, I was watching Taxi Driver, and I suddenly realized you were doing the scene from Taxi Driver, or years later, I was watching Sunset Boulevard, and I suddenly understood, you know, and I always thought that was kind of cool, like that we were introducing things, that we were treating the audience like they were smart, you know, and I, I would hope that that's what happens, that I hope that people, you know, I, I have this memory of being about 13 years old and watching Monty Python for the first time and thinking, I don't understand what this is about. Like, I don't get it. I don't, but I know it's funny and, but I don't understand the references, you know? And I think we talked about this a lot when we were doing Rugrats and Arnold and Recess and all these shows about let's write over kids' heads and trust that they're smart enough to know and they'll figure it out and they will later get it in the same way that we got I had to be in college before I understood the jokes from Monty Python, but I still got that it was funny, and I still still went around doing the funny voices and making you know being into it and being excited, and it made me it made me want to be smarter somehow, you know, it made me want to work harder and appreciate literature and all these things, and maybe I hope that that's what we did a little bit. I hope that people watch those shows and think, um, you know, I want to. <laughs> I want to watch these old movies. I want to read. I want to do it myself. I want to... I hope that's one of the things that we did. Yeah, absolutely. There, I mean, there's been a lot of people that we've talked with or that, peop, you know, pe our followers from our sites who talk about, you know, how much that the shows that, you know, like, Re like Recess and Rugrats and Heron, how much it had a big impact on people. And, you know, whether it was from an animation point or from a writing point or from 
you know, from teaching morals or from the characters, how that each of them are relatable. I mean, whether they don't know it or they do, I mean, you've d been a big influence uh, as well as, you know, uh, Paul and all the other people who worked on it. So there's a lot to give credit for. Well, and I hope so. And, and, you know, it's like you were saying about morality, you know, and, and with, you know, with Steve and it goes back, you know, I mean, I remember it, that makes me feel good, you know, and I feel, you know, it's like I said, as mad as I got at Steve and stuff, I still, he, he means a lot to me. And I still remember sitting in his apartment as a 23 year old kid thinking about the movies we were going to make that we never ended up doing and all this kind of stuff. And always thinking that we were making things that were about something. You know, and always thinking that we were going to be doing something that would be that ha would have that would mean something to somebody in the same way these old movies and old TV shows meant things to us. You know. Oh, trust but, me. I mean, a lot of these works mean a lot to people. I mean, they can tell you this for hours. I mean, Kevin and I can tell you this for hours that it really meant a lot to us. Yeah, and one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, just as a message to whoever's out there listening, I don't know if they're interested in making these kinds of things or not, but. I've thought about this a lot, how you can't tell what's going on historically around you. You don't know that this is the time when you should be doing that. So we all have our plans and our goals. Like, we want to, whatever, we want to write a movie, we want to write a novel, we want to be the greatest artist who ever lived, whatever. I want to have a rock band, whatever it is you want to do. And you go down that road, and you have to go down that road, and that's cool. But then the history is happening around you. You know, so the music industry is is crashing, or nobody reads books anymore, or whatever, you know? And you get depressed about it, and you want to not do it. But really what you should do is just keep doing your thing, because it's like the renaissance, you know, of, of stone masons and all these people who just happen to be doing it, and who knows what they were trying to do, but it opened up. There was this period of, whatever, 50 or 100 years, where that kind of painting and that kind of stone carving was really popular and and economically viable, you know, and people were into it. Or like, say, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all that kind of stuff. Like, that could never really happen again. But for a bit, it happened, you know? It was this moment where everybody in the world was listening to this one kind of music, it seemed like. And they were all listening to this music that was being put out by these few people, you know? And, and like, we all grew up, my generation all grew up wanting to be Francis Ford Coppola and John Ford and, you know, Howard Hawks or whoever we wanted to be. We always wanted to, we all wanted to be filmmakers, great filmmakers. And by the time we really were working, it was kind of over. Like, nobody was really making those kind of movies anymore. They're all making, like, what they're making now, superhero movies, you know? And those kind of, like, The Godfather's not getting made now, you know what I'm saying? But without knowing it, we, we stumbled upon this renaissance in animation, that happened for a very brief period, really the 90s, and kind of closed up again. And people are, you know, Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network, I mean, the Cartoon Network is kind of doing a version of it right now. They're, they keep trying to go back there. They all say they want to go back there, you know, all these executives. But except for Cartoon Network, I haven't met any executive, and Cartoon Network would never be interested in the kind of stuff I do, but... All the executives, they say they want to go back there, but then they, they meddle with it and they don't want to go back there. The things they say they want to do, they don't want to do. And I keep thinking how lucky we were, all of us, Steve and Craig and Paul and, you know, Joe Murray and Chris Pelosi, even though he'll never admit it, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, you, know, um, you know, Jim Jenkins and everybody you can think of, the guys with Arthur, all those guys were so lucky to be to have stumbled upon this period um, where really you could do your own thing for a little while. And then, it, and then you know, the, the, the vortex closed up again, and, and um, it's pretty hard, again, <laughs> to do anything that isn't owned already by the company, you know, or something like that. Um, but anyway, so that's what I wanted to say about that. So if I could say anything to any young people, who are listening, I'd say just do your own thing and if and try to always go down the road you want to go. But when something is offered to you, like writing cartoons, when you really wanted to be writing feature films, do it and just enjoy the hell out of it. Do the very best you can at it. Like Steve, like you know, write your own version of it. Be Steve, you know, be, do that. And then you might get lucky, and it might you may when you look back as an old man like me, looking back, going, hey. I was working during the Renaissance, and I didn't even know it, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. 
Um, I guess um, any anything else prepared before we conclude, Kev? I, I have a, just a, a quick question to ask. I apologize if this sounds corny, but if you could ever do a crossover with like a like for a cart like a cartoon series to do a crossover with Rhesus and Rugrats, what what cartoon series would that be? If you had to pick one, because I know they have Rhesus did a crossover with Lilo and Stitch, but if you if you had to pick a, a cartoon character to cr- do a crossover with both shows, what show would it be and why? Oh. <laughs> Man, I just don't know. You know, <laughs> the world of, it's funny, you know, when, when they did that Lilo and Stitch thing, we weren't really very involved with that. Kind oh, of. yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the problem is with that, with cartoons is that they have their own individual worlds and they right. feel very different. So, you know, you thought there was that thing with The Simpsons and was it yeah, Family Guy that did that? But then you think, boy, those two worlds don't intersect at all. They, they don't look alike. They don't sound alike. They nope. have a different sense of humor. And I feel like when you mix those two worlds up, it's almost like you're you you created an alternate universe, and it feels kind of easy to me. I don't really like it when you do that. And and, and the thing about our our shows are that even though they kind of there is kind of a natural progression, they feel like Rugrats and Recess, for example, feel like totally different worlds to me. Yeah, right. it would be strange to try to mix them because you know you got these in one you've got these. Babies that talk when when the bigger kids leave the room, and in the other one, you just got kids surviving on the playground doing their thing. It just doesn't seem like they mix. Yeah. And so I I know this is kind of an annoying answer to your question, but huh. I really wish that I you know I don't like those crossover things. I prefer not to do that. I like keeping those worlds separate. Yeah. That's just my opinion. That's fine. Yeah. Interesting. Because they did the. It, I remember the whole Flintstones meets the Jetsons thing, and there was like. <laughs> There was a lot of, like, you know, mixed reactions to that, and then with the Simpsons and the Family Guy, so I was like, oh, no, I hope they're not going to, like, do a, a kick, uh, a crossover kick, you know, with other shows and stuff, you know? Yeah, they do. It, they, it's, it's, a, it's usually um, a commercial consideration. It's yeah. Sometimes they do it because they want to bring life into a show that isn't doing well, so they try to mix it, you know, they try to put it together with a show that is doing well to try to right. get it to the one that isn't. It's just usually for reasons that aren't creative reasons. You know? Right, right. All right, well, I guess that we can conclude this episode of Casual Chats. Uh, right before we go, do you have anything to promote um, or, or plug or anything right, right before we conclude it? I am working on a new movie that's going to be a 3D movie about uh, the origins of Santa Claus. And I can't really tell you too much more about it right now, but it should be, it's going to be a while before it's in theaters, a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So I hope people look forward to seeing that. Oh, definitely. Very cool. Very yeah, definitely. that's very cool. We wish you a lot of luck on that. I wish you the best of uh, luck. No, I don't really have anything to plug and promote. I'm, 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 I've been working at Disney Junior for the last couple of years. I got married again. I, I kind of decided I was never going to do cartoons again because they weren't doing these kinds of things. But uh, I needed to work. So I um, worked at – I've been at Disney Junior. I'm on my third show. I worked on a show called Sheriff Callie's Wild West, which is a cute show. But these are for little kids, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm, I just worked on a show called Miles from Tomorrowland, which was a nice show. And now I'm working on a show called Goldie and Little Bear. And they're very cute. They're all three very cute. Um, but, you know, they're not that kind of thing. You know, they aren't those shows. But they're going to be good shows. Anyway, I think that should be it for this episode of Casual Chats. Once again, thank you so much for letting us interview you. Thank you so much. Thank you for writing my channel. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Thank you, guys. Take it easy. Anytime. Call anytime. And that concludes this episode of Casual Chats, and we hope to see you in the next one, so take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.